So Natalie, it looks like we have 22 attendees. Should we give it another minute or so? Yeah, we can give another minute. Sure, if you don't mind. No problem. I will. Uh, maybe we should get starting. I just don't want to take too much of your time. Um, so, um, yeah, I'll let you. And pay, probably some people are in a, a group elsewhere. I don't know. Sounds good. Okay, I'll mute myself and let you uh, introduce yourself. Okay, great. Thanks, Natalie. My name is Will McClintock. I'm a researcher and technologist. I work at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And um, I have a lab of software developers and planners that we uh, together develop technologies, both mobile and, and web technologies to support marine assessment and planning. So I'll, I'll uh, encourage you to kind of go through, if, you, if you're interested about my lab, a couple of different websites. One is mcclintocklab.org, so that will give you a sense of our our team and uh, there's a blog there that you can hit that will list lots of different projects that we're involved in how we've used our tools to support planning. Um, an hour isn't a whole lot of time to, to go through SeaSketch, uh, which is our main application. So I would encourage you all to, as we go through this webinar, if you have questions, type them in the uh, questions dialog box that's in the GoToWebinar control panel. So if you're looking at the control panel, just scan down until you see questions. And that's a, that's a uh, um, place where you can submit your questions. Everybody is in listen only mode at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and um, that's just to keep down feedback. But um, if you want to ask a question, type it into the, the questions box there. You can also raise your hand. Um, there's a, a way to do that. Um, and uh, I can, I can uh, unmute you and, and um, 
you can ask a question verbally. So I'm going to give you a very uh, brief overview of C-Sketch, which is this software service that we use for planning all over the world. And I'll show you some examples of how C-Sketch has been configured and give you real rough uh, pointers on, on uh, sort of the technology behind it and how it can be um, can, you know, adapted for a variety of different purposes. Um, there's a, at the C-Sketch uh, homepage, csketch.org, there's a link to projects, and that shows you the sort of the geographic distribution of the projects that we have. Lots of these are demonstration projects, as you'll see. Um, those are ones that I've set up like the one for you today um, and invited you all to. Those are all free, unlicensed demonstration projects not used for any planning purposes. So if you hit any of those projects, you'll see that a lot of them are not really configured to do much. The featured projects are those that have been used to support um, real world planning initiatives and uh, have a number of features in there that I like to draw people's attention to. We also provide educational projects. So these are fully licensed educational projects that are usually used to teach marine spatial planning in one way or another. You're welcome to go to that page, and uh, if you see a project that you're interested in, you can um, click on the icon, and that will provide a link to the project. So here's the project that I set up for you today called the Labrador Sea Project, which I've got open for here. So this is a project that I set up in about 30 minutes. And it contains all of the out-of-the-box features that C -Sketch, uh, any C-Sketch license uh, provides. So let me just walk through those basic features. So obviously, there's a uh, map viewer. Um, and um, it has base maps. These are Esri base maps, but you can provide your own custom base maps as well. Um, there's a legend. So currently I have one layer turned on. These are data that I grabbed from DFO servers. And so this one's just showing DFO marine protected areas. Uh, you can have control over things like opacity and so on. Very basic stuff. Each of these layers uh, has a description. That description defaults to this Esri metadata language, which is not very uh, user friendly for some, but meaningful to GIS professionals in general. That description can be replaced with a different document, a customized document, for example, something that you create with a style sheet to make it more user friendly. And that style sheet could also include, include links to downloading the data if that's something of interest to you. Um, so data are organized. Um, uh, by groups, however you want to organize them. I'll show you how all this is put together when we get into the admin interface. But it's pretty basic. You have layers that are that are that can be totally uh, public. You can have other layers that are viewable only by a, demo, uh, a group that you've defined in C-Sketch. So these demonstration layers, the World Database on Protected Areas, is a layer that only the people in the DFO group can see when they log in. So just to prove that point, uh, let me pull up Safari. Here's the same project. Uh, you can see I'm not logged in here. So this is what the general public sees. They see uh, these DFO data layers because they're open to the public, but they don't see these demonstration layers because I've restricted that to the DFO group. The general public, if they click on my plans, will say we'll see this message that they have to be logged in to create plans. Um, and the general public will see that there's a public forum and then there's an open survey. But that's it. That's all they can see. Data layers, a tab that says they need to log in to create plans, and a participate tab that allows them to participate in forums and participate in surveys. So let me go back to this view where I am logged in. You can see I'm logged in. 
anybody in the world can log in and create an account on any C Sketch project. They're open to the world. What the uh, general public can do once they've created a, a, a login is defined by all the permissions you give those people uh, in the administrative interface. So it could be that a member of the general public logs in, they don't see any data, they don't see any My Plans tab or Participate tab, they just see a default base map. That's it. Um, but the more permissions you provide them, the more they can do. Okay, so at its very basic um, sort of state, C-Sketch is a data viewer where you can turn it on and off, data layers, um, you can click on features, and get pop-ups with attribute information. That, uh, that pop-up could also contain a hyperlink to a document or another website or a survey that pertains to that place. So the, the sort of fundamental, I guess, um, uh, feature of C-Sketch is the ability to sketch and evaluate perspective uh, zones. And um, I've created what's called two sketch classes, an MPA and an MPA collection. These are just things that people can create under my plans. So, for example, if I wanted to, uh, you know, draw a perspective marine protected area inside one of these zones, I could say create MPA, draw a polygon, give it will a name, I'll call it Will's uh, MPA in zone 2H. And this sketch class, MPA sketch class, has been configured to allow the individual to select um, a variety of allowed fishing uh, gears or permitted fishing activities inside this particular perspective MPA, um, whether or not aquaculture would be allowed or anchoring. Once those questions have been answered about that place, I can save it to my plans tab. So here's the thing I just drew. And you can click on that thing to see when I drew it, who drew it when, it, when it was drawn. And then I can run a little report that tells me, based on an algorithm that was defined by this paper, um, this place I've drawn has, will, receive, will, will be moderately regulated based on these allowed gears and activities. So this isn't saying anything about what is protected. It's just saying this is a general sort of classification scheme for MPAs based on that classification scheme, which uses these uh, gears. Um, the, uh, th this particular MPA is assigned a level of moderate, moderate regulation or moderately regulated extraction. So these individual things that I draw can then be placed into collections like this one I've started here. And that whole collection then can be analyzed to get it to, in the same way, to get a sense of how protected this area is based on that algorithm. So the report tells me that I've got four MPAs with varying levels of protection. Using this algorithm, my, my level of protection score is 4.1. This particular method was developed by uh, some folks in Portugal and um, is a method that we're likely to apply in British Columbia with uh, some slight modifications. But to start out with, we often just place this, these MPA and MPA collection sketch classes into a project so people can begin sketching and evaluating zones and getting a sense of what that workflow looks like. So once something has been drawn and an individual is ready to share that with somebody, uh, they can um, post those, those sketches into a forum. So you can see here I've got a demonstration forum um, where I've already posted something. I said I've attached a collection of plans, uh, which are prospective MPAs with varying levels of protection using this method. And then if you click on the map bookmark, 
you'll see the view of the data that I was looking at along with the, um, the EZ. And uh, I have a couple of drawings that are alerting the user, user to a specific place. In this case, I'm saying perhaps we'd ex we could explore another uh, location for an MPA right here. And then my, my uh, message that I posted three days ago includes my collection of, of zones. These zones that I've posted can be copied by anyone with access to this forum. And those things end up in their My Plans tab. And from there, they can edit you know, any one of the plan elements like this one, change the boundaries, so on, change the attributes, give it a new name perhaps. Um, and then if they want, you know, rename the collection and share it back in the forum. So here's my edited version. I can include a map bookmark and attach my plans. So since you are all uh, have been invited to this project uh, and you've been given access and, and you've been assigned to the DFO group, you should all have access to this DFO forum. Um, so I'll just go ahead and create a post there. So, you, so if you happen to be looking at C-Sketch on your own computer, you can see this happen. Call it Will's post. Here's my latest design. Tell me what you think. Okay, so you'll see that that message has just gone through. And if you are logged in and you're looking at the DFO forum, you'll see this message pop up. I could also share this post with a, a link via um, email or Facebook or Twitter. And then when somebody sees that message, gets that link, clicking on it will bring them right into this forum and right to this message. And that way we can kind of encourage participation. Um, these forums can be completely public. And uh, some people um, are a little worried about opening things up to the public sometimes. Uh, I'm going to create one in the, in the public forum right now just to show you that these forums have controls to uh, moderate, the, the, moderate and, and sort of limit how people um, use the forum. So if it's an unmoderated forum, as this one is, anyone uh, can report a message content as inappropriate. And administrators will then have the um, ability to either delete that message or um, not delete that message and indicate that they've, they've seen that it was reported, but they've decided not to delete it. Um, only administrators have the ability to delete messages. That's something that um, we intentionally do so that as conversations develop underneath the forum, uh, we don't have people misunderstanding what other people are saying by having them delete messages and so on. So these, these are permanent messages. They can be deleted by an administrator. So if there's something that somebody absolutely cannot have um, public and they've made a mistake, um, they can contact the administrator and have them delete, delete a message. Okay, so I've shown you data layers, the My Plans tab where you sketch and evaluate plans, the Participate tab, which includes a list of forums, and those forums have various levels of, of permissions based on the groups that you define in C-Sketch, and then there's surveys. So surveys, this is a, um, another out of the box kind of survey. Surveys are used to collect information from people uh, and they could be, uh, this one's you know, how, how people are using the ocean, where they're going, what they're doing, and how they value that space. This is a pretty generic one, uh, but you can see that if you're taking the survey you, and you're a commercial fisher, you could say, um, I fish here using this kind of gear 
and I fish here using this kind of gear. And then the application asks the user to um, assign values to these places. So how valuable are these places? And value could be monetary value, spiritual value, any, any kind of value. Um, and so I might say, well, the first one I drew is where I do the majority of my fishing. So I'm going to give it 80 points. Um, the second one I drew, I'll give it 20 points. Now the points add up to 100. I can submit the response. And I can answer other questions, too, that pertain to energy sites, ports and harbors, existing marine management areas, and so on. So once I submit that response, then I'll turn these off just so you can see. You can see that as a user, I have um, submitted, submitted two survey responses, one on February 8th and one on February 4th. Um, in fact, those are all the responses in the survey right now. An administrator like me can look at the total uh, number of um, responses. They can look, I can look at the um, attributes that were filled in for each of these responses. And I can download responses as a CSV, or in the case of the spatial content, the, shape, the, the shapes, I could download it as a zipped shape file and then summarize those offline. So for each of these things, the data layer tab, my plans tab, um, and the uh, participate tab with forums and surveys, there are lots of good examples out there of how they've been used and, and uh, ways to configure them to facilitate collaborative design of plans or, or, or participatory mapping. And I'll show you a few of those in just a sec. Um, that's just so you know, the C-Sketch interface is translated into English, Sp Spanish, Indonesian, Norwegian, and Portuguese. And what that means is when, when someone chooses a uh, interface language, uh, then you'll see changes in, in the things like the title of the dialogue tab or the, the um, data tab, data, data log, data tab, uh, my plans tab and um, participate tab. And then the things like the, the, the uh, contextual menus and things change to the language of choice. Of course, if the data layer tab has not been, or if the data layers themselves have not been uh, translated, they're just gonna see the, the, the names of the the data layers as they were put in by the by the administrator, which in this case was a guy who speaks English. Um, we, on Monday, we'll we'll um, we'll turn on French translation, so you'll be able to, to um, do all of this in French as well. And that's true for for um, both the user interface and the administrative interface. So that's the br very broad overview of the of the user interface for your demonstration project which is called laboratory c um, i'm an administrator and so is natalie so the two of us have a link in the top left uh, here um, that allows us to configure the application so clicking on there this is something that that uh um really you know speaks to the heart of c-sketch though lots of people won't see it the project managers and administrators will see it um, and that can be any number of people in your group uh, but it really does speak to uh, a large um, sort of the power of c-sketch and that it's really highly configurable and to configure it you don't need for the most part any sort of technical background or technical ex expertise so let me walk you through these um, these uh, various tabs in the administrative interface so you can see the kinds of things that one can configure. Um, in this basic info tab, this is where you can uh, add things like a logo, a custom geocoder. You can turn it on and off the project uh, so that it's either viewable uh, by everyone except uh, by everyone or not viewable except by administrators. You can change the default map extent, the interface language. Um, you can choose measurement units. Um, 
I won't get into adjacency tolerance. Email notifications, um, that's so that if you want people who are participating in forums to get automated emails that something is going on in a forum, somebody's post a message, then they'll get an email. Same thing with um, new data layers. If new data layers are being added to the, to the project, then users will get an email notifying that new data layers are available. Um, this is where I configured the, the, the users for this project. So Natalie sent me a list of people that would be attending the, the webinar. And I bulk uploaded all of you to the project. Some of you I can see, Adriana, Amos, 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 sorry, uh, Anna, Bethany, you've all opened your email, clicked on it, and registered. A number of you have. So you are all now, you now have access to the, not only the project, but the data that are visible only to the DFO group. So you see here that I've defined a group called DFO, and these are all the, the members of that group. There's also a group called McClintock Lab, which is just the members of my group. Oops, and Dan should be an administrator, so I'm going to give Dan administrative access as well. There's other groups that I put in here, Fisher's group, planning team, science team, stakeholder working group. You can create any number of groups, and you can create any number of users. Uh, the C-Sketch license does not limit the number of users that you can have in a project. So it's completely unlimited, nor does it limit the amount of activity that any of those users can do or the things that they are allowed to do. That's completely um, open-ended. So you can invite as many users as you like. The data layers tab is where you, you can select your default base map. Um, so if we wanted to go with the ocean base map, we would set that here and we would publish it to map to the, to the end user. So now anyone logging in for the first time is gonna see this oceans base map instead of the topographic map or the streets map. Data layers are added here and, and these can be um, any kind of Esri map service or WMS, WMTS. And the data that we, that we put into C-Sketch comes from any number of sources. So um, a lot of the data that I grabbed here came from DFO servers, um, and some of the data that I grabbed came from the World Database on Protected Areas. So one just opens up this tab, uh, goes to you know a place where uh, you know that there are some data that are useful to you, and uh, I don't know. Let's see what I want to put here. Uh, so here's a list of, of public data. Um, I only want open data and I want Esri web services. Uh, so here's one uh, that I've just found. Let's see if I can find the, uh, the web service. Okay, so here's a web service in English. I'm just going to grab that. So this is a URL for a map service. I'm going to copy that and paste it in here. C-Sketch has found those data and I can add them to my map. So here they are. Um, I'm not sure this is relevant to this geography, so this might be a, this might not, oh yeah, so they're showing up here. So here's the data that I just added. Um, I can edit the name of this thing. I can do all kinds of things to um, limit how people uh, interact with those data. Uh, I can um, ensure that only those data are visible by one or more groups, right? So I could say only DFO and only Fishers can see those data. Um, now those data are in, in the project, and as an administrator, I can uh, publish those changes to the end user. So now anybody um, who's logged in and has permissions or belongs to DFO or Fishers group can see those phishing effort data. Um, the data have 
uh, all kinds of attributes associated with them. Sometimes they're useful bits of information, sometimes they're not, like in this case. So these pop-ups associated with the features of the, of the data can be edited. This is a good example of one. So um, I added this one a couple days ago and then went in and configured the pop-up associated with that, that uh, feature, um, that map service, and limited the, the um, information coming from the attribute table to the English and French names of the zone and the English and French names of the zone type. I also uh, added a link to um, the to a to something that came out of the attribute table, uh, a URL which brings the user to more information about that um, about that place or that that data set. Um, so these links can can be any number of things. They can be links to PDFs, links to websites, um, links to surveys, links to all kinds of stuff that you want the user to associate this place with on that data set. Okay, so that's data layers. Um, maybe I'll just place, oh, I'll just leave that there. Okay, forums. So this is a this is where you can create um, all kinds of forums. And right now you can see I have a DFO forum. That DFO forum uh, has read, uh, read and write access limited to the DFO group. I could require admin approval before publishing messages. I could, I could also restrict file uploads to administrators, but I haven't done that. Here's a public forum, which has been configured to allow anyone from the public to enter into that forum. Uh, they won't be able to participate in that forum unless they create a login, but again, anybody can do that. Um, there's an admin forum. This is a super useful forum for administrators to just kind of talk back and forth about the project and share map data and talk about you know whether or not the analytics are working properly and so on. And a planning team forum. So if you wanted to create a forum for fishers to discuss some sort of private matter, you could create another forum for them and just give access to the fishers for reading and writing to that forum. So now that exists. The sketch class tab is where you create these things called sketch classes. These are the things that people are drawing and evaluating. So remember, we had this MPA sketch class where people could sketch an MPA, give it a name, define the gear, um, so on and so forth. That form was created uh, here in the admin interface. So let's say I wanted to create a new generic sketch class, a zone, for example. I just create a new sketch class called zone. It's going to be a, a polygon type. I'm going to allow anyone in the world to uh, draw a zone. And by default, they have to give that zone a name to distinguish it from other things they've drawn. Um, but they could also add uh, information by text fields, areas, choice fields, preference fields, sliders, data fields, so on and so forth. Um, I'm just going to add a simple text area and call it description. And then if I had lots of questions that were dependent on other questions, I could set up field rules so that if somebody says, I'm drawing a MPA of type uh, IUCN type 4. Then it pops up another question and says, okay, what are the regulations that you're proposing that suggest that this would be a type 4 uh, MPA? Geoprocessing is something I'll get back to in just a second. But this is where we set up how these various sketch, sketches are analyzed to generate reports. And then symbology is simple. This is where you, you indicate how these things, these sketches are going to look to the user, whether they're going to be hashed um, or, or you know, colored differently. Okay, and finally, before we get into uh, analytics, um, I wanted to point out the survey tools. So this is a this is a the human use survey that I pointed out earlier. This is just a, a template that we borrowed from another project. We have a series of of templates you can you can borrow from. You can also, if you're an administrator on more than one project, you can copy surveys and copy sketch classes 
from those other projects uh, if they're useful to you. All right, so that's the basic for your project, which is free for as long as you want to use it to test out, see if this is something that you, you find useful. Um, if you're interested in becoming an administrator to get under the hood there, you can email Natalie and she can just simply make you an administrator and then just have at it, go in there and mess around under the hood and see what this thing does. Let me, before I pause for questions, just show you a few other um, projects that I think um, illustrate how C-Sketch is used. Um, let's see. So here's uh, a project uh, that we developed for uh, the Marine Planning Partnership of the North Pacific Coast. And um, you can see that it's got tons and tons of data that have been categorized. You can see that um, their uh, descriptions link to this custom metadata, right? So that's something that they um, work really hard at is making kind of human readable, uh, um, easy to read uh, metadata for their, for their layers. Um, what I wanted to show you though was some of their analytics. So here's a zone that I drew and when I view attributes and reports, I get a whole bunch of different kinds of reports back. The size of this thing, coastline length, average depth within this zone, the zone type that I've indicated. Um, under the ecological integrity tab, we've got things like overlap with biogenic form, community forming species, EBSAs, or IBAs, um, We've got how this thing stacks up in terms of MarkSan analyses. So this is something that I think des could deserve a whole hour of discussion, but I just wanted to show you this to indicate how we integrate uh, MarkSan into C-Sketch to let users know whether they're drawing place that is a high value um, place for protection based on, say, an, a, 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 a um, MarkSan model. Um, adjacency to breeding bird sites, overlap with marine classification, so on. Human well-being, overlap with commercial fisheries. So these, these reports contain, can contain links to the data layers that they were used to, to analyze them. Um, overlap with recreation visit, visitation. So this is a layer that was created in an application called Invest, and you can see that my MPA is really not overlapping with areas that are important for recreation. Uh, fisheries overlap. So is it overlapping with red urchin dive fishery um, and how much and what percentage of the, of the coast does that represent? In the governance tab, we have things like overlap with pro existing protected areas, uh, fisheries closures, provincial tenures. So this is a good, a good example of a uh, project that had lots of different reports. Um, and these reports are developed in collaboration with my lab. So that's the probably the singular important takeaway from this webinar is understanding that you can do lots of different things in, in most things in C-Sketch without communication with our lab. Not that I'd encourage that, but but because I think we have a lot of good input. But but uh, the one thing where you're really um, dependent on our lab is the the development and publishing of these reports. And we've been doing this a long time now, so we can develop them very very quickly. But we develop them using ArcGIS server. Um, so basically creating analytics in Python and then generating reports in JavaScript and HTML. And um, so these reports that we're looking at were um, developed by talking with the planners and the scientists and the, and the GIS folks to get a sense of what the data were, what the goals and objectives of the planning process were, and how we could represent um, uh, some sort of analytical results that helped users understand whether or not they were meeting the goals and objectives of, of the planning process. Um, so if we take a look under the hood here in this particular project and we go to the sketch classes, 
if we look at any one of these zones, um, you'll see that under the geoprocessing tab, there's a whole lot of uh, geoprocessing services. So these are like map services, they have a URL endpoint. And these are things that we developed in the lab, we published to a server, and, um, and then we connected the results of these uh, geoprocessing services to a reporting client code. Um, so CSketch takes a polygon that somebody draws, runs it through these various analyses, and then spits back, back the report to the client using this code. Um, there are uh, ways to use CSketch that aren't just about sketching and evaluation. In other words, drawing perspective zones. Sometimes you want to just uh, reach out to individuals and have them comment on um, uh, existing plans or evolving plans. So surveys are really great for that. Besides just collecting information on where people are doing things, you can have people comment on specific plans. And this is really rough. Um, Amos and I were, were uh, on a call yesterday kind of thinking about how this thing should look. So this is just drafted as of yesterday. But it's a survey that says, OK, find, find a site on, on the map that's of interest to you. And um, I'm not going to. This is uh, this is old data. This is not current data, so um, don't worry about it. But um, actually, this is the data I wanted to show you. Uh, yeah, drafty. No, no, no. Hmm. Where is drafty? Drafty. Oh yeah, I can search for it. Drafty. There we go. Fragments. Okay. So this, this uh, survey is kind of walking people through um, these, they're calling fragments, but they're basically prospective sites. Um, and you can click on a site name, discover its uh, subregion, the clump it belongs to, the name of it. And then you can go through and answer questions about, um, about that place. And, um, and so you can choose a specific uh, area that you're commenting on and propose different management measures, um, add additional information about it. Um, you can go through and do, you can propose alternative boundaries. So if you think that some place is, needs to be moved or a different area needs to be um, protected, or if you, you know, that existing area just needs a slight modification of boundaries, you can draw those boundaries here, add comments and so on, and then submit those responses. So, um, Again, these are these are um, surveys that provide administrators information, and only administrators can see the responses. Those are typically downloaded, um, summarized in some way, like with a heat map or you know in a document, and then presented to decision makers or stakeholders. Okay, that's a. There is so much more that I could go through, but I'm I'm conscious of the fact that I've been yapping for for uh, 45 minutes. So I'm, I'm going to take a look at the questions that you have. Um, and one question is, where do the data sets live? So the data sets come from any number of sources. And uh, in this case, with the Labrador C um, project that I've thrown together for you, these data sets are sitting on this server. It's a DFO server. Um, we often, when we work with large groups like yours, like with our with the Department of Conservation in New Zealand, we often use data sets that are just residing on internal servers that are controlled by the agency and we have nothing to do with them. In some cases, um, it's useful to set up another server uh, that, that uh, we use for a variety of purposes. Um, that is outside of the agency, and we use Amazon Web Services typically uh, to set up an ArcGIS server instance. Um, but data can also come from other kinds of servers and other kinds of services. So uh, the, the data could come from other government agencies running GeoServer and publishing WMS map services. So they can come from anywhere. Um, and where does the data reside when creating plans? So this is an interesting question. Uh, if 
if somebody is drawing an MPA like this, if that's what you mean, I'm not sure if this is what the question is asking, but I've created a polygon and I've added, I've changed some attributes. Uh, this polygon now since sits in a central database. It's not accessible to anybody but the individual that drew it um, until they submit it to a forum and then it's accessible to uh, the people who have access to that forum. Um, that central database is on a single server in, in AWS. Um, that's the CSketch database server. So the database server for CSketch is really only capturing these sketches and the forum content. Um, so if somebody types something in there, that, that ends up in a, in a database. But it's accessible only to our team, my team, the, the C-Sketch developers. Um, but along those lines, administrators do have access to this button, which uh, allows them to download all forum content which would be all the text that people have, have written in any of those, the, those uh, messages and all the geometries that they've posted. So the geometries would be in, uh, in GeoJSON format and then the text would be in CSV. Uh, another question, so that when you bring the data sets into a project, they are still accessed to the link and not saved on CSketch. That's absolutely right. These these data layers that have been added to C-Sketch are not in any way contained or owned by C-Sketch or they don't go into a C-Sketch database. Only the link does. So um, if DFO decides to delete this map service, it's gone from C-Sketch, which is you know, by design and has uh, real benefits and also has some limitations. So if you're, if you're running a project and you're not in touch with the individual that, that hosts that data set, and they think for some reason that data set needs to go away, then all of a sudden you have a project that doesn't have those, that data set in your project. Um, um, so you know, to have sort of maximum stability and um, uh, sort of reliability of your project, um, we often encourage people to set up a server, you know, either within the agency or um, on AWS with our assistants to uh, put all of the relevant data sets into one place that you have complete control over. That's not always possible. You know, some of these data sets, by, especially, you know, by design are, are, are uh, made available only through map services and not downloadable um, for privacy protection or, or whatever policy, uh, IT policies people have. Um, okay, so I've answered all of the questions um, that are in the question box. Um, um, well, this is Natalie. Um, there's one question I try to answer, but I think because I have a minute went into it. I mean, not that I tried to answer, I tried to ask, but I went into the answer um, box. Um, so essentially I wanted to know when you were talking about the base maps, can we upload our own base map and can it be set as a default as well? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. So um, in the da project dashboard, the admin dashboard, you'll see under base map, so data layers, base map, there's a button for add custom base map. And it tells you the kinds of uh, maps that you can use and then how to upload a thumbnail and if you wanted you could just have that single base map and then hide all the others so um, for example um, I could choose to disable this dark gray base map or enable it right so you don't have to you can use your own and you don't have to use the the Esri base map oops oh shoot so um, sometimes you'll discover that we uh, we have a um, just a slight outage, and it usually has to do with connectivity. I'm at my house, so that's probably what happened. But C Sketch will go down, and then if you just refresh, it comes right back up. Anything that you, you're doing in C Sketch is automatically saved. There's not a save button, so you don't have to worry about dis uh, disconnecting from the internet. So that answers your question, Natalie. 
Yes, uh, perfect. And also just another question. Um, are you aware of any other federal departments from Canada um, that purchase C-Sketch or are applying it? Um, well, I know that um, I know that the the MPAT project, Marine Protected Area Network Planning Project, um, that um, is is supporting DFO. I don't think DFO D, it, it, the 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 contract that we got to create this project in British Columbia is through Tides of Canada. Um, so, but we could contract directly with with DFO. If that's helpful. There are a variety of ways that we can create contracts, standard contracts and licensing agreements. We can do grants, um, uh, invoicing, all that kind of stuff. So, whatever works best for you. Um, but, but I don't think we have four projects in Canada, but I think all of them have been contracted by um, uh, groups that are either supporting um, DFO or doing stuff outside of DFO. Okay. Um, so I just want to encourage the um, people online to ask questions because we have uh, the source right here um, to answer our questions. So take advantage of that. I see Scott has a, a question about the French version site. Ah. Yeah. Scott, are there plans for a French version of the site? Yes, the plan is Monday. On Monday, when you go up here, with the uh, French included in this list of of languages, and um, it will uh, probably need some refinement, um, which we will do based on feedback from folks like you. So uh, on Monday, if you want to come back, visit this site which is just labrador.csketch.org, or you can find it on the C-Sketch project site. Um, that, uh, click here, um, choose French, and then walk through it and see how, how it works for you. Thank you. Um, on, uh, while I'm sort of on uh, thinking about it, notice to the right here, it's kind of cryptic, there's a button that says help. And if you click on the help button, <clears throat> That gives you access to a knowledge base, uh, and it also allows you to contact our support team. So as you're messing around with C-Sketch and you have questions, you are welcome to send us messages. And because this particular tool goes to my whole team, we should be able to answer your questions pretty quickly. Um, and this is what stakeholders often use too. They'll submit questions being sort of confused about one thing or another. Sometimes it's a process question. If it's a technical question, my team handles it. If it ends up being a process question, we often forward that on to the, the planning team that we're working with. Other questions? Let's see. Uh, let's see. Joanne says, as you may know, storage and server on the DFO network is problematic. Can we? actually store and manage data uh, on your server site database. Yes, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned, in lots of cases, um, people want to have their own servers for a variety of reasons. And a good example of, of that is uh, this one in Montserrat. Um, all of these data are being stored on a server that we set up. So here's data one dash bluehalo.csketch.org. That's just a server that we created um, on Amazon Web Services uh, to support this particular planning initiative. And that database, that server, and that and, and that configuration costs about $2,500 a year, and we just pass on that cost to the to the user. So, um, I mean, to the you know the owner of the project. So we don't make money off of that. And while we're on the topic of making money, we are we are a nonprofit. We are at, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. This is not a for-profit uh, event, so it, we do keep prices um, down. They're they're limited, and um, I think very competitive with with any other kind of um, uh, service like this. You know, I know there's some there's some people have some questions about um, how does this compare to ArcGIS Online um, and uh, what are the feature differences? And, and I, I really have to say that to get a better sense of that, you really need to talk to somebody who uses ArcGIS Online. I, I dabbled in it a bit seven or eight years ago, um, and it wasn't serving our purposes. And when the Esri 
uh, CEO Jack Dangerman um, knew that I wanted to develop C Sketch, uh, and I got a half million dollar grant to build it, and then matching funds from other organizations. I built it uh, with sort of a a, uh, a vision that was independent of ArcGIS Online. In other words, you could pull services in from ArcGIS Online, and you know maybe maybe leverage other features in ArcGIS Online if you wanted. But I didn't see it as something that was really um, uh, as streamlined and dedicated to the purposes of marine spatial planning in the way that I envisioned it. Um, so I don't really know. I mean, I, I'd say if you want to know the differences between C-Sketch and RGS Online, you really got to talk to somebody who uses it. Um, but yes, uh, can you store and manage data on my server? Yeah, um, we we for example and um, all the like, well this project as well. We have servers, they're ArcGIS servers running on Amazon Web Services, and we just turn over the keys to that server to our project um, GIS specialists so that they can publish their own map services and um, uh, um, apply um, security you know to those layers and add them to their C-Sketch project on their own. We do that all the time. Any other questions? Well, let me um, just end then by encouraging you to uh, feel free, all of you, to contact me um, by email, phone, or Skype. And visit our sites. I'm very happy to, to walk through um, any parts of C-Sketch and share with you our, our uh, experience doing green spatial planning. I guess you know what I really want to emphasize is that we have been doing marine spatial planning, marine conservation planning, and sort of related stuff for about 15 years. So the, uh, the things that we can help you with go well beyond the technology, you know, and, and into how technology can be implemented and how a process can be structured to make use of that technology. So um, if you have any questions about any of that stuff, I'm happy to chat with you via Skype or exchange emails. Um, that's what we're here for. So please don't hesitate to, to reach out with any, any question, basic or otherwise. Um, well, I see there's a couple more questions, but before that, uh, Joanne had a follow-up question to her first question, um, something that if we're considering uh, storing or managing the data on your servers, but actually we're, just to answer Joanne, we're actually, there's different solutions that are being explored right now to do everything, post our our, our, our maps, our data um, on DFO servers. Um, so we can talk offline afterwards if you want more information on that. All right, nice. And then, yeah, I see yeah, Nick, a question about the location of the AWS servers. So we can we can host those AWS servers wherever there's a, a, a AWS server location. And so when we're when we're uh, servicing British Columbia, we I think we use the servers in Oregon. Um, when we're servicing folks in um, Europe, often we're using the ones that are in Ireland. Uh, so there, there are. We choose the the closest uh, server bank to you to minimize latency. Um, but I have to say that the kind of data that are transferred over the network um, are often so small that um, it, latency hasn't really been a problem. But if you're if you're a GIS professional and you're trying to push up data to the server, yeah, you know, it'd be good to choose a a server location that's as close to you as possible. I don't know, and maybe you know, Nick, that. Um, whether there are um, AWS servers that are physically hosted in Canada, I imagine that there are. But if that's important to you, we can choose those. Yeah, no problem. Um, ah, so another question from Adriana. When the data sets are updated, how do you update the project? Um, well, data really exists in two ways, maybe three ways. 
Um, data like these that are map services, right? So um, if somebody, well, let's take a look at another project that isn't so potentially sensitive. So let's say um, here's a data layer that sits on a server. Um, that server is data1-bluehalo.csketch.org. Um, if somebody said, oops, I need to update uh, um, this map service, um, they just push a new map service with the same name up to the server and it automatically updates CSketch. Um, there's, you know, if, if you are a GIS person and you're responsible for managing the data and, and, and pushing the data up to CSketch, um, that's, you know, there, there are ways to do that that make it um, easy and less problematic. And I would sit with you to talk about how to do that in a really streamlined fashion. But that's basically it. You just publish your new data set to ArcGIS server or whatever map service server you're using, and then um, it automatically updates. If it has the same URL, it automatically updates in CSketch. If it's a new URL, then you just have to grab that new URL, put it in CSketch, and replace the, the existing one. And again, there are ways to do that that keep things clean and from breaking that, that um, I would share with you if we had more time. Um, a little more nuanced is the data in um, the analytics. So in this project, we have, um, you know, uh, an, an analysis, for example, that analyzes um, the dive and fishing value captured within a uh, prospective zone. So that geoprocessing service contains some Python and a data layer that it's it's analyzing. It's, a, it's analyzing a dive and fishing value data layer. So that layer would need to be updated in the geoprocessing script so that the, the analysis was accurately evaluating that, that new data layer. And the way that you do that is you basically just send us the new data and we'd update it in a matter of minutes. So that's one thing that we need to do. We are the ones that are publishing these, these geoprocessing scripts. I, I hope this isn't tangential, but I think I'll mention it anyway. Um, we are uh, you know, seven years into um, C Sketch now, so we're looking at code, or you know, the result of code that's been developed over seven years, and it's time that we did a full rewrite and. Uh, considered new ways of doing things, and we're looking at possible ways of doing that, collaborating with various agencies and foundations and so on. But, but one of the, the features that will change is, in addition to being able to use ArcGIS Server uh, as a geoprocessing engine, uh, we'll we'll be able to use a um, our own custom uh, custom geoprocessing engine that will run on AWS Lambda, basically using JavaScript and so on, and, and Python. And th those will be things that potentially um, our clients can write and publish. Um, so there will be a day in the future when even the development of, of uh, the analytics and the reporting code will be more hands off and you'll, you'll be able to do that yourself without our help. But for now, you know, if you have new data, you share it with us, we update the, the analytics and that's how it works. I have one more question. Um, I don't know if you can just uh, go over a bit the licensing, um, how it, it works, um, sure. what's the initial fee, what's the annual fees afterwards, yep. what services you provide afterwards, um, just to let people know also that we're kind of looking into the option of getting an enterprise license for the department. Right. Um, okay. And that we have to build the, like at uh, Oceans Management at NHQ, we're, looking, we're developing a rational to submit to IMTS. Yep. Um, so anyway, just to let people know about the, the options of licensing. Sure. So a single project license is $1,000 a year, and that's for unlimited use, unlimited number of users, $1,000 a year. On top of that, uh, you can um, plan on about $10,000 for basic support, and that basic support is um, updates, troubleshooting, um, uh, bug fixes, and so on. 
and maybe a simple a simple analytic. But when you but then when you start to uh, work with us and determine what kinds of analytics and reports you want, then we need to start budgeting for those. And that's you know a really big project like the one I was showing you earlier with 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 Map and all of these um, complex analytics.